This is lesson 1.4. It's all about sedimentary rocks. Our objective today is to learn about the different types of sedimentary rocks, how they form, and how we classify them. So most of the Earth, Earth's crust is made up of igneous rocks, but most of the rocks exposed on the surface of the Earth are sedimentary rocks, and they're formed by compacting and cementing together layers of sediment. You learned about this a little bit during the lesson on the rock cycle. So there are three basic formation processes for sedimentary rocks, and they produce clastic sedimentary rocks, chemical sedimentary rocks, and organically formed sedimentary rocks. So the clastic sedimentary rocks are formed from fragments, little bits of other rock. These can come from the weathering of igneous rocks, or the weathering or the breakdown of metamorphic rocks, or the, metam uh, the uh, weathering of other sedimentary rocks. The pieces can be really, really small, absolutely microscopic, or they can be large, large chunks. But once the pieces are broken away, weathered from their parent rock, they're then transported and, uh, and relocated. Most of the time, water acts as the transport agent. Once those little bits, those sediments, make it into a stream or a riverbed, particles will then be further broken down. They're often rounded out by friction against, uh, of rubbing against other particles. Then, when a stream or a river runs into a lake or an ocean, the speed of the current, well, it decreases substantially. As a result, there's not enough energy to keep moving the big particles. Those large particles, they will settle to the bottom of the uh, lake or ocean first, but the smaller particles will travel a little farther and settle out further down. This process is called sorting, and we're going to watch a little animation of how this takes place. Did you catch that? If not, go back and watch it again. So the end result is that as a river moves into the ocean or a lake, the largest size particles, first gravels and then larger sands, will settle out first, closest to the shore. After that, uh, intermediate size particles like sand size particles will settle out further from the shore but the smallest size particles, these are called silts or clays, they'll be transported the furthest. It takes less energy to move the smallest size particles and they'll go a long ways. They'll settle out much farther from the shore. So particles end up sorted by size. The largest gravels are first deposited, then the sands, and then the silts and clays. Over time, large amounts of sediments can accumulate as rivers transport uh, sediments from the continents into lakes or into oceans. And as sediments build up, the weight of overlying sediments, well, it increases the pressure on everything underneath it. That pressure pushes particles closer together. And at the edges of those particles, things can start to glue themselves together. This process is called cementation. So cementation, just like cement, occurs when minerals fill in the spaces between grains of sand or uh, grains of gravel or grains of silt or even grains of clay. This cement, uh, cementation process binds together, it holds together loose particles like a glue. And the minerals that are involved in making the cement are found naturally in ocean water or in groundwater or in lake water. They can be minerals like silica, SiO2. Remember, that's like quartz. They can be minerals like calcite, calcium carbonate, um, or calcium magnesium carbonate. 
And they can also be iron oxide. And it turns out that whatever the cement happens to be tends to really change the color of a rock. Um, rocks that have a silica cement, so a quartz cement, tend to be gray or white. If they've got an iron-based cement, uh, they tend to be red or brown. And then calcite cements um, tend to be gray. But whatever the cement is, as that cementation happens and the pressure increases, those sediments become more compact, they become a lot harder and denser, and eventually they will turn into rock. This process is called lithification. It's not fast. It takes millions of years, but eventually piles of loose sand and sediment can become new rocks. Remember that these um, sediments, little bits of all other rocks forming together, form what we call clastic sedimentary rocks. And clastic sedimentary rocks are primarily categorized by the size of their grains, the size of their particles. Uh, if you look at your rock identification handout, the same one I uh, showed you during the igneous rocks hand, uh, lesson, you'll find this scheme for sedimentary rock identification. This is also uh, on the uh, lesson as well, just this part of it. So when we look at this, we see that the clastic sedimentary rocks are on top. They come from particles um, that were broken down and weathered off other rocks on land um, and then transported most often to lakes or oceans. Um, and they can vary in size quite a bit. The grains can be large, like pebbles or cobbles or boulders, and all of that can be mixed together with other smaller sized particles. Um, if you've got large grain size mixed together with small sized ones, you have either conglomerate or breccia. We call it conglomerate if the particles are rounded, um, and we call it breccia if the particles are really angular. Um, so we classify these or subclassify these based on uh, the shape of the particles as well. Um, for sand size particles, that means a grain size between 0 0.006 centimeters and 0 0.2 centimeters. So up to two millimeters in size for grains. Um, those we call, well, get this, sand size particles, we uh, make sandstone. Smaller particles, uh, silt size particles, make siltstone. And clay size particles, this is the uh, finest size of particle, the smallest, um, those make shale. When you see shale, it often splits into layers really, really easily. And the types of minerals in these are often quartz and feldspar, um, and other minerals can be present as well. So these are the clastic uh, sedimentary rocks. Here, I've got some pictures for you. Take a look at this one. Here we've got fairly large size particles, definitely bigger than two millimeters. So even though there's fine grain bits in between cementing everything together, this is still either a conglomerate or a breccia. Because the particles are rounded, we call this a conglomerate. Here I've got a breccia. Um, again, the particles are quite large, but this time they're angular, not rounded. Um, and here I've got a picture of this in a large scale. I took this photo somewhere near Thunder Bay. Um, so this is a, an entire cliff made up of very large size um, particles. They're so large, they're about, well, they're larger than my hand in some cases, um, and they're rounded. So this is an example of a conglomerate cliff. Then when we look at the smaller, finer grain ones, here you've got a picture of sandstone. Um, even in the photograph, you can just about see the sand sized particles. And often this layering is visible in the sandstone. You can literally see where the layers of sediment built up one on top of another. Then over here we have shale. 
This is the smallest size particles. You can't see them easily with the naked eye, but if you feel that rock, it feels like a little bit gritty. Um, and shale splits into fine layers, thin layers really easily. It's very flaky. So that's an identifying feature of shale. Okay, moving on to the chemical sedimentary rocks. So keep in mind that water often contains dissolved minerals. It's not pure water. If you uh, pour a glass of water from your tap and you leave it sitting on the counter until all of the water evaporates, most of the time, depending where you live, there'll be a fine layer of white stuff left behind. That's the minerals that were dissolved in your tap water. They're not harmful. Um, they just occur naturally as water flows through bedrock. So chemical sediments form when these types of minerals precipitate. It's like a large scale version of that white stuff forming in the glass you left on the counter too long. There's a few common chemical sedimentary rocks. One is rock salt. It's made up of the mineral halite, literally sodium chloride. Um, a second is rock gypsum. Remember that really soft rock you learned about in the first lesson? And some, but not all, limestones. Here, the photo shows an example of a salt flat. This would be an area where there was a um, like large shallow body of water um, and the water all evaporates. These are fairly common. Um, in Western North America, Western Canada, you end up with um, like lakes that don't last the whole year. The water evaporates and it leaves behind a lot of minerals. This can be how sedimentary rocks or chemical sedimentary rocks are formed. The last kind of sedimentary rock I wanna talk about is the organic sedimentary rocks. These ones form from sediments consisting of the remains of plants and animals. Couple of examples, one is limestone. So limestone um, actually forms from uh, the shells of little marine organisms. So it forms most often when calcium and carbonate ions in water are used by organisms to make their shells. And then when those organisms die, their shells pile up and then can get broken down into smaller fragments. Once they're broken down into smaller bits, they can become pushed together and cemented together, lithified, to form limestone. Limestone is super common all across Ontario. If you live in Ottawa, this is what our primary bedrock is. Um, if you're in um, the Toronto or Southern Ontario region, there's a lot of limestone, but there's also something called dolomite, um, which is similar to limestone, except there's more magnesium in it. Um, so limestone and dolomite um, are common in Southern Ontario, but limestone in particular is very common around the Ottawa region. Coal is another example of an organic sedimentary rock. Uh, coal forms from the remains of dead plants and animals. Um, it, all that carbon stuff is cemented together over long periods of time and makes that characteristic black rock I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, so, oh yeah, limestone makes up most of the bedrock under the general Ottawa area and most of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence lowlands. Limestone is normally pretty light gray in color and it often has fossils in it. Chemically, it's made up of calcite, which is CaCO3, calcium carbonate. And one of the things to note is that calcium reacts easily with acid and forms bubbles. Dolomite, the one I mentioned that's found in southern Ontario, um, is similar chemically, but it's got more magnesium in it. As a result, it reacts a little more slowly in acid. Let me show you what I mean by an acid test. So here, I've got a piece of limestone. When we take um, some weak acid and we drop it on that limestone, Oh, I don't have it very well in focus, but it bubbles pretty aggressively. If you listen carefully, you can even hear it bubbling.
If you look there at the white, little bubbles have formed. So limestone bubbles aggressively, even when weak acid is dropped on it. Think about what that might mean for limestone erosion um, in locations with acid rain. Here I've got a sample of dolomite, and this dolomite uh, is pretty interesting. It's local. Um, if you look carefully, you can see some fossils that are pretty common in the region. Um, these little circles indicate ancient marine organisms that lived. Um, and on the back side here, you can see some more fossils, um, which are kind of cool. Okay, but this dolomite. So this, when I take regular acid and I drop it on there. Oh, terrible at showing this, sorry. Um, you don't really see any bubbles at all. But if I take a nail and scratch at the surface to break it up into a powder, um, now there's a greater surface area exposed. And I do get some effervescence. A few bubbles start to form. And no one's going to believe me because my filming's terrible, but I promise it's true. Limestone bubbles aggressively with acid. Dolomite or dolostone will bubble with acid, but only after you scratch the sample. When we go back to look at our scheme for sedimentary rock identification, you can see our chemically or organically formed sedimentary rocks are down here on the bottom. Um, on the top, we've got the chemically formed ones. Their texture is always crystalline. You can see little crystals in them. Um, and the grain size can be from fine to coarse, but it's never going to be as large as like pebble sized. Common ones or common uh, chemical composition or minerals present in them are halite, so sodium chloride, gypsum, or dolomite. Um, these form from um, either water evaporating or chemicals precipitating. So if halite or, rock, uh, or sodium chloride is the principal mineral, well, we call that rock salt. Um, if gypsum is the principal mineral, we call that rock gypsum. If dolomite is the principal mineral, we call that dolostone. And again, this is pretty common along the Niagara Escarpment in southern Ontario. Then, down here, um, we've got the organically uh, formed um, sedimentary rocks. Their grain size can be either microscopic uh, to quite coarse. Um, if it's calcite-based, well, then it's limestone. These can form from the precipitation of uh, like uh, shells from little marine organisms. Um, and if it's carbon-based, it's compacted plant remains, and that's coal. In particular, we call it bitumen bituminous coal um, if it's not compressed very densely. Um, this can be compressed more densely to form a different form of coal. This scheme kind of leaves out one other interesting organically derived sedimentary rock. Um, and that one's called chert. So chert is this very fine grain quartzite. It's made from the remains of special algae. They're called diatoms. So these diatoms are photosynthesizing organisms that live in lakes and rivers and, and oceans. They actually produce the vast majority of our oxygen on planet Earth. And they have cell walls that are made up of silicon dioxide literally glass. Under a microscope, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, and you can imagine when all these little glass bits die and settle to the bottom of a lake or an ocean, they will build up. Over time, these glass bits will get cemented together and compacted and lithified to become a mineral called chert. So this is kind of what chert looks like. It's really fine grained in texture. It'll feel very, very smooth. Um, when it chips, it kind of forms concentric rings. Um, and chert has been used for centuries across North America by the First Nations people to make tools, 
arrowheads, um, axe blades, that sort of thing, all have been produced from chert. Okay, some of the large scale features of sedimentary rocks. First, one of the major identifying features if you're looking at a large expanse of rock is stratification. This is visible layers. As one type of sediment is laid down on top of another, these different layers will show up. They'll remain as the rock forms. Um, they'll be visible. So we call this stratification. The, the plane between the two different layers is called a bedding plane. And most of the time, because sediments are typically laid down flat, bedding planes are horizontal. They can, however, end up cross bedded if a river is depositing the sediments and there's a current um, and it deposits them at an angle. So stratification is one of the identifying features of a large sedimentary rock. The second is fossils, the remains of animal life, the remains of plant life, or even structures that formed when the rock formed. You only find fossils in sedimentary rocks. The process of making igneous rocks or metamorphic rocks destroys any um, features that the rock had before. So uh, fossils are great evidence that you've got a sedimentary rock. <coughs> Here, this photograph, um, well, it shows you some antelope, but it also shows badlands. And the sedimentary nature of these is visible. Here we see the different layers where the rock was deposited. This is the stratification. Between each of those layers, where the colors are different, that's the bedding plane. Here I've got a photo of some large scale fossils. This right here is an imprint fossil of a bone. This is present in uh, limestone somewhere in Utah. <clears throat> you also can end up with features like ripple marks and mud cracks preserved. Okay, so imagine you're at the beach and you know how sometimes you get that those ripples in the sand. Those ripples that formed um, as waves were washing over uh, a shallow beach, those can be preserved over millions of years. So these ripples in this rock here, they didn't form after the rock formed. They formed as the sediment was deposited. So ripple marks are another great fossil and evidence that this is a sedimentary rock. Another kind of fossil is mud cracks. Imagine a mud puddle that dries up in the spring and you see those cracks in the mud. Well, those cracks can get filled with other minerals that look different um, and can be preserved over millions of years. Here's a great example. And again, it's evidence of sedimentary rock formation. Oh, um, and this is Crow's Nest Mountain in southern Alberta. And I think I put this photo here to remind me to talk about uh, those mud cracks. I found a great example of it there. Okay, so um, most of the time here we've been talking about sediments that have been deposited by water. But sediments can also be deposited by wind. You can imagine that only the smallest sized particles blow in the wind. So uh, sedimentary rock, clastic sedimentary rock that's formed from wind deposited sediments has a very, very fine texture. This is uh, in Utah and it's aeolian or wind deposited sandstone. So literally probably a hundred meter cliff. Sorry, ignore the announcement in the background. Okay, so this is in Utah, um, beautiful Aeolian sandstone. Uh, other cool things you see in sedimentary rocks is really weird towers. This is again in Utah. You see these crazy mud towers that have been weathered in bizarre ways. Um, here's some more of them. There's narrow, narrow corridors where the water has run down and eroded all of the sandstone around them. Um, and you can see the stratification here. You also see something called a hoodoo in sedimentary rock formations. 
This is an example. These are common in badlands everywhere. You see them in Southern Alberta, you see them in South Dakota. Um, and I even think there's a place in Ontario where you can see them. But what's happened here is that we had um, sedimentary rock, layer upon layer, all these different strata built up. But this layer in particular was a little bit denser and a little more compact than the layers below. So as the rain came down and the water started to erode um, this rock, the top layer was most resistant and the layers below got eroded away. So you end up with this little cap on top of the tower. So these are called hoodoos. Um, and you get places where there's just literally hundreds of them. This is Goblin Valley State Park in Utah. It's full of them. Uh, you also see crazy strange structures. These round, very spherical boulders are rare and they always seem to be made of sedimentary rocks. These ones are from Kansas, but there's some in Southern Alberta too, uh, made out of sandstone. Um, and they and have this weird spherical shape to them. Um, okay, take a look at this layer of cliff. Is this sedimentary or igneous? Well, just by looking at it, we know it has to be sedimentary. We can see the stratification. That tells me this is sedimentary rock making up this cliff. Uh, this boulder, um, it's fallen a long ways. It may have moved orientations, but we can still tell it's a sedimentary rock because of the layering in it. Even though it's detached from the cliff, you can still see the stratification. Then these rocks, what do you see in there? Well, these are fossil trilobites, um, ancient marine organisms. Again, because there's fossils, we know for sure it's sedimentary rocks. So from here, make sure you watch the second video and then fill in your flowchart. After that, you'll do an activity where you need to identify some sedimentary rocks.